Being friends, uh, thank you for this very special honor. In about uh, one hour from now, I'll be giving my last lecture. But this is my first lecture as a, a retired or retiring uh, faculty of CMC Vallo. Thank you for this honor and for uh, patiently waiting to listen to this. This is not going to be a very hi-fi talk, uh, considering the time and being the last uh, lecture of the conference. <clears throat> heart failure is the final pathway of uh, many heart diseases, as we know. And that is because it is the burnout uh, destination of various kinds of treatments that uh, we have been doing for various diseases. If it's left alone, it will progress and be fatal. And it is already one of the largest public health concerns globally. In our OPD, for example, over the years, we've noticed that every fifth patient that we see in our private OPD in all three units happens to have some form of cardiac failure, not necessarily with a low ejection fraction, but complaining of breathing difficulty from a pure cardiac uh, origin. It is also true that you as physicians will be seeing a lot of cardiac failure. Most of it goes unnoticed, but it is also something that will cross into nephrology, gastroenterology, general practice, geriatrics, apart from our own department. What is the Indian scenario? The sad thing is that there is no collated epidemiological data on the incidence and prevalence of heart failure that gives a true picture. But we believe that it will range anything from point, point, uh, 1.3 to 13 million. Uh, excuse me. 13 million, and this is on the basis of the Trivandrum heart failure registry, which uh, is fairly recent. There are it is believed about 6 million heart failure patients who are in need for special care, which means either hospital or home nurse or heading towards uh, more specific treatments like CRT and transplantation. When the Trivandrum heart failure registry was looked at, it was found that 25% of people had normal ejection fractions. And therefore this gets categorized into this new terminology heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, but they have symptoms of heart failure. 75% of course are those who have got low ejection fraction. The difference between the Indian uh, registry figures and the world figures is that our patients present at a much younger age group, 56 versus 72, as per the inter-CHF study. And the male to female ratio is also skewed in uh, disadvantage to the males, 70-30 versus 50-50 overseas. We also seem to have a worse prognosis. Uh, we don't know the reason why. About 8.4% in-house mortality compared to 4% in the West. Now, why such large numbers? We have two categories of aging patients, the healthy aging and the unhealthy aging. Sadly, heart failure forms part of both. Treated and surviving CHD, RHD, and IHD patients, the treatment modalities of different cardiac diseases has been fine-tuned to an extent that people with congenital heart disease who never used to survive beyond their 30s, 40s, are today surviving into their 50s and 60s. So is RHD and so is IHD. And finally, they are none of them are immortal, they will always zero in into this entity, clinical entity of heart failure. It is also true that in India we are watching uh, rather with a lot of concern the rising prevalence of CAD and the high incidence of diabetes, hypertension, renal diseases, all of which will finally contribute to the evolution of heart failure. It is also partly true that better diagnosis and awareness and sensitivity to heart diseases makes the patient present to clinicians much earlier. Now, over the years, heart failure has come one full circle. In the night before the 1980s, it was purely non-pharmacological bed rest. You are resigned to your fate of living in an armchair uh, the rest of your life. It was acceptable. 
But then towards the 80s, there was more emphasis on the combined role of digoxin, new diuretics that came on the platform and dopamine, both in pulse form or uh, in, in, in various other treatment uh, methods. Into 1990s, which saw the discovery uh, or understanding of the neurohumoral pathways responsible for heart failure and the discovery of ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockades and other drugs which became then available to the clinician. 2000s, it was more interventional where people took to finding out whether device therapy, uh, maybe experimental stem cell therapy, better surgical techniques and transplants began to impact the outcome of uh, people who had severe heart failure. It is now interestingly turning one full circle where the medical world is now looking at why wait to treat, why not preempt and prevent heart failure and have taken this back to the homes because of the rising expenditure of heart failure treatment. So we are now looking at a, at a segment of heart failure treatment which is actually domiciliary, which is run by heart failure nurses and technicians who are trained in a special way to lifestyle modifications to make sure that people who have got heart failure are rehabilitated apart from those who may be sitting on the fringes. The care spectrum of heart failure has also gone in two different directions as I mentioned. One is on the left side towards home. And this is a big movement in the US, partly because of insurance and patient payment concerns, but partly because of the comfort patients have with the new remote technology and gadgets that are available to them in monitoring. And the other end is a more aggressive end of the spectrum where we find it easier to move people into device therapy, homing into transplantation, which is not yet a big reality in India. You see the extreme ends of the spectrum. On one side, it is self-care or an assisted allied personal care. Or on the other side, it is specialists, heart failure, heart transplantation specialists who will take care of the patient. The sad thing about heart failure is that by the time you recognize heart failure, it's already too late. <clears throat> As this uh, picture will show, stage A, which is maybe undetectable, we have so many reasons that can be, so many risk factors that can be modified uh, to prevent the initiation of structural changes in both the myocardium and in the vasculature, like LVH, disturb microcirculation, myocardial infarction, which is responsible for both diastolic and systolic dysfunction, which will eventually cause systolic and diastolic heart failure. Unfortunately, it is in that yellow circle that uh, people present and we pick them up, by which time it is too late. I won't go into the detail as we all know that cardiac insufficiency of any reason causes low perfusion pressures, which will then stimulate a cascade of uh, three things, the stimulation of the uh, RA system, the vasopressin and endothelin, which increases the vascular tone, resulting in um, also salt and water retention, which then gives a good thing in the secretion of natriuretic peptides, inducing some diuretics in form of autotherapy. So these have interestingly formed the targets of uh, medical therapy, where the pharma industry and the um, scientists are looking at these three platforms which we can intervene to make uh, heart failure eminently treatable. It's important to understand that uh, the acute and chronic uh, terminologies are now giving way to more of uh, advanced, preliminary, refractory and terminal heart failures. This is important for uh, general medical residents and uh, general physicians because this helps you to triage the patients who may have just stepped out of the domain of general physicians into the more advanced uh, cardiac options. There are three things that we must understand, the three entities of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which is below 40 or 35, some books will say. Those who have got a mild form of ejection fraction reduction 40 to 49 and those who have got surprisingly 
uh, normal ejection fraction. This is the category that has to be focused on because in a busy outpatient, we might miss by just cursorily looking at the echo report and say EF, normal, so be it, you can go to respiratory medicine. There are other uh, classifications like new onset, transient, chronic, etc. And this is just an academic. It's interesting and we might question what does it mean? Those with preserved ejection fraction, are they at a higher risk? Maybe not, but they are definitely at the same risk as this uh, graph will show that the uh, hospitalization rates for those who've got uh, HP, H HFP, EF, is uh, quite significant when you compare it to other clinical diseases that we have, which makes them present to hospitals much less. Uh, this is the same thing which I said, but our focus today will be on the on basis of EF, those who've got low ejection fraction, those who've got worsening symptoms of heart failure, and those who are in class three and class four, which is the ones that will be on the cusps of refractory heart failure. I must emphasize this, that heart failure is essentially a clinical diagnosis. I'll repeat that, heart failure is essentially a clinical diagnosis. So I believe that general physicians can just as well diagnose heart failure accurately without having to depend on the ultra high fi tests that cardiologists might indulge in. Signs and symptoms, a good history and a physical examination like JVP, enlarged liver, pulsatile liver, edema, sacral edema are all things that one must focus on. This can be augmented by assessing BNP, especially in acute situations, uh, using a bedside echo nowadays in casualty and in a more advanced setting, maybe MRI if you're suspecting specific uh, etiologies. It is important to quickly classify them into preserved or reduced ejection fraction and then chase the etiology if possible by, uh, by switching between MRI, TEE, SPECT and biopsy. To classify them, you risk stratify and then a plan along with the specialist or the general physician or the general practitioner, whether it is home-based therapy, pharma, device or transplant. The topic for today is refractory heart failure leading to cardiac transplantation. What is refractory heart failure? One in the acute setting is the one that has presented with acute myocarditis or whatever etiology and therefore has a fulminant presentation. Can also be seen in children for reasons unknown. They usually decline very rapidly and are relatively resistant to the standard modes of therapy. It could also be chronic where they are slowly burning out, progressive needing increasing levels of hemodynamic support and uh, admissions. They're usually unresponsive to standard or even aggressive medical therapy and are therefore in class four, which should alert you as a clinician to say, maybe he is going to the phase where he requires bridge therapy towards uh, cardiac transplantation. I think it may be enough if we just highlight the principles of therapy in refractory heart failure. One is, as I mentioned, a detailed assessment of history and physical findings. It's important to identify comorbidities, and there are plenty which we often tend to miss, not be aware of, and ignore. Is there an underlying ischemic heart disease? Is there thyroid disorder, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, surprisingly? obstructive sleep apnea and chronic renal failure. There are, apart from comorbidities, triggers, which again is missed easily, arrhythmias, a run of atrial fibrillation or PSVT, uh, fever of uh, which, which may be low or moderate grade, anemia of whatever cause, deficiencies like vitamin D. You'll be surprised our population in general and even the medical doctors, if you do a vitamin D level on yourself, you'll be aghast to find that most of us are vitamin deficient. It is an uh, increasingly recognized trigger for ischemic heart disease and heart failure. Other deficiencies like B12, B1, and of course sepsis. I believe that all patients who are on the fringes of refractory heart failure or advanced heart failure will do well 
to be admitted for two to three days in the ward. It does not have to be in the cardiac ward. It can be in the medical ward for intense hemodynamic monitoring and initiation of therapy, which will lead you on to uh, tailoring pharmacotherapy. And today it's possible with the huge armamentarium of drugs available, it's possible to, to tailor therapy customized to the patient. And of course, to finally consider upgrading treatment modalities. I'll show this again. It's important for physicians to uh, understand and realize that the comorbidities with uh, heart failure become significant not only as a cause, but also as a cause of irritating progression. Apart from COPD and obstructive sleep apnea, depression, sleep disturbances and cancer, hyperlipidemia, iron deficiency, diabetes, anemia, cachexia, obesity, two opposite ends of the spectrum, renal dysfunction, hypertension, and angina. And if you find that they have any or more, one, more than one of these, they must be tackled. That itself can put them back by one class, from class three to class two, or from class four to class three. From a treatment perspective, this is one easy format which was published in, I think, 2002, and this is very, very clinical. Quickly identify four hemodynamic subtypes. The patient who is warm and dry, like all of us, no evidence of higher filling pressures or low output. You must even suspect whether your diagnosis is correct. Uh, but if they are, that means you're treating them well. You have the warm and wet patient who's congested but has without no low output, it's normal output, which will give you a bigger window to increase diuretics, maybe even try the more powerful loop diuretics and metolazone, give IV, nitro, and neseritide. <clears throat> the third category is cold and wet, where the patient is congested and has low output, more difficult, more advanced, you have to first take care to heat them before they dry. You have to give them, uh, touch them with inotropes um, and maybe withdraw beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, which may be causing them to, to uh, be a little hypotensive. And of course, the cold and dry patient who has low output but has no congestion. Maybe you've over dehydrated him. Uh, he may be fluid deficient and therefore he must have very, very cautiously monitored volume replacement. Maybe the vasodilators must be withdrawn and to get him back into shape. This is a general management scheme of heart failure. The first uh, rectangle is important and I would only highlight that these are all the things that you are familiar with. But what is new is the first one, the arni ace combination which is now currently available for uh, Indian use. It is, uh, it is the combination of sacubitril valsartan and uh, it's uh, claimed to be a wonder drug as we study the literature. The drug armamentarium today put in a profile would uh, rate the Arni plus beta blocker plus uh, MRA to give the maximum reduction in all cause mortality with of course various combinations that are listed just below that. Um, this is repetitive again to show you the, the large uh, uh, therapeutic window, therapeutic uh, options that are available going from loop diuretics to beta blockers to uh, ACE uh, inhibitors, ARB, ARNI, etc. This is the most famous study that uh, is now being talked about, the role of um, a uh, coded drug called LCZ-696, which is basically sacubitril valsartan combination, 200 BID, which uh, has caused a significant drop in the all-cause mortality in patients who've got heart failure. But remember, and this is not often highlighted, these are all patients who have chronic heart failure. It has not been tried and tested as well in those who have just tipped off the inflection point and are in severe heart failure. Coming to device, uh, there are lots of devices that are being tried and I will uh, ignore most of them except to say the time tested ones. Those who've got atrial fibrillation or have got uh, for high risk for sudden cardiac death need to have an ICD. 
because that can be fatal. But there are other forms of uh, device therapies that are available for the symptomatic class four. We are not quite ready in CMC for any kind of bridge therapy because of cost concerns. But we have LVAD, we have done impeller device for one patient very recently. The HeartMate artificial heart or the Javix heart is not available. It costs, uh, you know, a lifetime savings of an average Indian patient. There are devices that can control rhythm like ICD, CRTD, dual chamber pacing. I mean, these are all considered when the hemodynamics is completely altered, like a cardiac index, which is less than two liters, systolic blood pressure is constantly below 90, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is more than 20, and the systemic vascular resistance is high. Cardiac transplantation is still the gold standard for heart failure treatment, and I believe it will be for some time to come. It is limited to refractory and advanced heart failure. There are lots of limitations which the Western population, the Western medical world seems to have conquered. There are anecdotal case reports of people in their 80s having successful heart transplants. Uh, COPD, neoplasm, psychosocial disorders, compliance issues are all things that matter more to us uh, in India than and then in the West. The absolute indications are those who are in shock, but have got, uh, you know, the overall physiological profile is favorable for them. Those who are dependent on inotropes or frequent hospital admissions and are persistently in class four. It will result in dramatic improvement of quality of life. And in good centers, the one year survival is close to 90%. In India, we are uh, beleaguered with the problems of expertise, uh, legislation. Do we know that in India, we do not have a stable program for heart transplants. It's done sporadically, anecdotally. A lot of noise is made, but nobody knows what happens to the patient. Legislation is just ready. The networking and organ sharing uh, policies are in place, but we are still troubled by cultural taboos. The donor is from one religion, the recipient from another. What do we do? All kinds of social and societal issues. The logistics is a big problem, starting from the accident site, organ retrieval, transport, preservation, etc. Not to mention the cost, which is prohibitive. We are getting there slowly with the uh, Mohan Foundation and the organ sharing network uh, getting their act together. And I believe that in about a year or little more than a year, we'll be ready to do the first transplant in CMC Velo. There is an entity called terminal heart failure, which is that category of failure for which even transplant is not an option. What do we do with them? We have to uh, offer them palliative care, which is basically again back to home care with people who are trained in terminal care. They're usually class three, class four with untreatable comorbidities like far gone ischemic heart disease. EF is constantly less than 20%, low cardiac output, sinus tachycardia, renal failure, high incidence of sudden cardiac death. So where are we uh, in our institution? As I mentioned, cardiac transplantation is sporadic in India. Uh, and therefore, I believe that, I strongly believe that if there is one institution which can create and sustain heart transplantation as the cornerstone of heart failure therapy, it is CMC Velour. Not because we have the best cardiac surgeons or the cardiologists, no, but we have uh, a group of support departments like uh, immunology, infectious disease, general medicine, intensive care, and put all that together we will be able to create a program that is sustainable and hopefully in the Kanigapuram phase of cardiology that might happen. A preparatory phase for this began in 2005 when four or five faculty were trained in Papworth Hospital, but uh, it got derailed because of various uh, logistic issues. So the appeal is that we must, along with us, you must also stress on the needed focus, the multidisciplinary approach, uh, creation of the facility and overall a very powerful vision to make this happen in the near future. 
we already have a revised uh, set of faculty new to the game but trained adequately to start off cardiac transplantations so i believe in the picture of a huffing and puffing uh, donkey carrying this heavy cart uh, we are still closer to the goal of offering what may be the next step in the treatment of refractory heart failure, cardiac transplantation. And we can pep up for a better tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that very interesting talk. Uh, Sir, has there been a cardiac transplant previously done in Tamil Nadu, sir? Yes, plenty. Uh, in Chennai, uh, there are a couple of hospitals that are not only in Chennai. I think uh, there have been cardiac transplants in other cities. I think Madurai. Uh, in Chennai has had the maximum experience. Uh, they do it uh, now fairly regularly. I think there are about uh, uh, 15 transplants a year maybe a little more uh, because of better organ retrieval and it's actually cross-connected with multiple hospitals including us so we we are actually providing them with the donors donor hearts any questions from the audience so you mentioned that sacubitril well certain Will that become the standard drug of choice to start off with, or you still recommend no. ACRB yeah, and I, then you add on and go to that? I should have mentioned no, if the patient is on ACE inhibitor, there's a washout period. You've got to wash uh, them out from the ACE inhibitors because there's a lot of hypotension that can come on. But as I mentioned, this is uh, one more powerful supplement to the existing protocol of heart failure therapy. It is not as effective as standalone neither is it effective in acute fulminant heart failure without the others so you can't replace any of the others i must also mention that uh, you know don't decry digoxin i find that even in my own department digoxin is never a choice in heart failure i'll tell you it's a wonder drug it cannot be an accident that for 100 years uh, you know uh, digoxin was a cornerstone of heart failure therapy. So when you have a patient who's failing all the modern treatment, just touch him with digoxin. You will see him smile within a few days. Uh, so digoxin, diuretics, uh, ACE inhibitors in preserved ejection fraction, calcium channel blockers, which will not work in reduced ejection fraction, beta blockers and beta blockers like bisoprolol, cavidolol are excellent drugs. But there comes a tipping point when this is not enough. That's the time to add on sacubitril valsartan, which unfortunately is extremely expensive. I think one tablet is uh, 120 rupees or something like that. What is the cost that we are expecting in cardiac transplant? Cost? Uh, right now, the Chennai, um, in a not a very commercial setting, the transplant admission itself might cost you about. 16 to 18 lakhs but that is just the beginning because there's a whole lot of immunosuppressive therapy and uh, frequent biopsies so the patient must uh, be committed to a resource of about 30 lakhs which is a big problem for us you know it is beyond the reach of a common man thank you so much